Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. anyone to us, by the time anyone got to us, I think it was chaos. the weather was so bad, there would be nobody to there. Run to the beach full of blood. And the next thing I hear was alarms, Chances screaming. Chances of survival were very, very slick. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so they would send the kids in first. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain burst. I'm proud of the pain. crew, proud it's of what kid. I've achieved and what I'm doing. The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. For today's bonus episode, Angus Horden spoke with David Michael. David is a former captain of the Royal Australian Navy and current president of the Naval Historical Society. I'm Angus Horden, and today I'm speaking with David Michael. David, welcome to Life on the Line. No, thanks, Angus. It's a pleasure to be here. David, what first took your interest in the military? Well, uh, growing up as a schoolboy in Townsville in the 60s, there was a heavy military presence in Townsville and the new Laverack Army base was being built up. Vietnam War was underway. So it was a bit hard not to be influenced by the military. But perhaps the um, the most influential thing was the brand new shiny attack class patrol boats used to visit Townsville regularly and sailing dinghies on the harbour, you couldn't help but be impressed. So uh, that, plus my father's service during World War II, probably the main influencing factors. You mentioned your father in World War II. What was his service? Well, he, he, was, uh, he joined in 1943, uh, only saw the last two years as a 17-year-old when he joined. Uh, he was an ordinary seaman, served in the um, landing craft, and he was involved in a couple of the landings in uh, Borneo and uh, the Philippines. But very proud of his service and very proud of his captain, who in, in later life he got to know the son of the captain, uh, Commander Bunyan. But yeah, and also very proud of his shipmates. And again, later in life, he um, made contact through the Canimbla Association and um, made a number of acquaintances and friends through that. So when did you join the Navy? Uh, I joined in uh, 1972. I was a senior entry at the Naval College at Jarvis Bay, basically 17 year old which uh, was the start of a 40-odd, 43-year career. So when you say Jarvis Bay, do you mean Creswell? Yes, HMAS Creswell at Jarvis Bay, yeah. Having also served at Creswell, can you elaborate on the natural beauty of that wonderful base? Oh, actually, when you go back today, and uh, I go back periodically to present a history prize um, to uh, new entry officers, but at the time, uh, you didn't appreciate the natural beauty. It was... um, Training from dawn to dusk seemed like very hard times at the at that time. But uh, when you go back today, it, it's idyllic. You joined a generation of naval personnel who saw no operational service for a couple of decades following Vietnam. How did you find that? Well, I guess um, we didn't even think about it at the time. We were busy, you know, in in the early seventies when I joined. We were busy training and and then deploying and doing exercises. Yeah, it wasn't anything to worry about at the time, but probably today, it's probably more of a humbling feeling or an embarrassment when you you go along to an Anzac parade in uniform or um, some other ceremony, and the young sailors who've been in the outfit uh, only a short time are are covered in medals, So, uh, which which is just a a fact of life, a fact of history. Um, So you do feel a bit humble on those occasions, but but certainly looking back, uh, no regrets, I think... uh, Certainly, it was a great experience, and I had uh, you know, a lot of challenges and uh, enjoyed the whole experience without, fortunately, having to be directly involved in any serious operations. I suppose that's why we have a defence force, as they say, it, that if we have people appropriately trained and doing their job, we can avoid actually having to go into war with people. And that is the best result. And you just happen to be in a period where, fortunately for you and indeed the nation and the world, we weren't at another cataclysmic event. No, that's that's right. Um, I think uh, from personal experience uh, during the first Gulf War in 1990, we, uh, once the Cabinet had made the decision to send ships, we had three days' notice to send those ships. Admittedly, they, they worked up, but, but three days to get them prepared and deployed, uh, I thought it was quite remarkable. At that time, I was involved in a logistics role, but uh, it just shows you the importance of training and, and being prepared. 
Can you share with us a few of the highlights and the fun memories over those seafaring days? Yeah, probably the earliest experience was on HMS Melbourne, again, as a midshipman doing training, 1973, just watching air operations, you know, observing you know, flight deck landings and catapult takeoffs. Also being in a mess deck where right below the landing spot where aircraft picked up the arrest of wire and thumped on the deck and, and the arrest of wire ran out. That were really um, educational as well as interesting experiences. And then um, on a patrol boat, actually putting your training to use, astro navigation in particular, I remember having to, to make a rendezvous, um, which after several days passage in, in the tropics out of Darwin, poor conditions, um, but lo and behold, the astro worked. We, we met the task group at the right time in the right place. So that was wonderful. And then, then again, same patrol boat, uh, experiencing a, a cyclone and also again in Melbourne, experiencing horrendous weather in the Great Australian Bight. Uh, those are sort of things you, you remember. Uh, open bridges on HMS Duchess, crossing the Tasman um, when it was wet and raining and big seas. <laughs> the, um, the bridge was always wet. Um, David, just before we leave that, for anyone who hasn't gone through Bass Strait with bad weather, it's a bit hard for them to really picture how bad it can be, whether you're in a yacht or whether you're on a patrol boat, etc. Can you try and explain to people what it's really like when you hit bad weather in the Strait? Certainly, uh, on that experience in HMAS Melbourne, we were going east to west, and uh, the flight deck is about 40 feet uh, above sea level. We were carrying or wearing green water across the flight deck. The bow was burying itself into the swells. The sea boats, which are on cradles, again on the main deck, um, probably 30 feet above the water, were um, lifted off their, their cradles and, and smashed. So that's, it just gives you an appreciation of the force of nature and the sea is not to be uh, taken for granted. Are there any funny stories um, when you actually get ashore? Because often, you know, you're working flat out at any particular time and then the relief comes when you actually get some shore leave. Actually, no uh, funny events ashore spring to mind, but, but certainly one we were at anchor in uh, Queen Charlotte Sound in, in New Zealand. We were on HMAS, I was on HMAS Jarvis Bay, the training ship, and we were conducting navigation training for midshipmen in Queen Charlotte Sound and anchored off Picton one, one night. And uh, early the following morning, getting ready for sea, the navigator was on the bridge doing his sort of pre-sailing checks. Obviously, the whole ship does pre-sailing checks. But one of them was to test the ship's siren. And uh, lo and behold, 5 a.m., <laughs> the uh, siren went off and stayed on. <laughs> and the navigator was a very prim and proper British Royal Navy exchange officer. And uh, he felt he probably should do something about this. And uh, he piped, um, isolate the siren, <laughs> which, <laughs> as anyone who's been in the ship knows, that um, the engineers will respond any change in sound or machinery they'll respond rapidly so, but the midshipman made a great um, joke of that during the uh, end of cruise um, review which is usually final night in july 1990 you're promoted to commander what's your role at this time actually on, on promotion to commander i was posted to naval support command which is in uh, the remington building in the city at that time uh, and i was posted as the staff officer logistic plans and it really, it was a one-man department. The job prior to me arriving uh, hadn't really done any serious logistics planning at all. You were basically a staff officer to the Admiral who used you as he saw fit. But one month after, in uh, August 1990, Saddam Hussein and his army uh, invaded Kuwait. So uh, everything changed for me within a month. Now, I'd never written a logistics plan, but I learnt very quickly. But the um, the first step then was to, to go off and decide which port we were going to, once once the government decided to deploy ships, we had to decide which port we'd support them from. And then following that, setting up all the, the logistics arrangements for that in the Gulf. And doing that in, in Amman was the, uh, Muscat was the port we'd, we selected. That had its own difficulties because there's no diplomatic representation in Amman. So when we got across there, it was a matter of uh, do the best we can to put in place everything you know, from scratch and build relationships with the local government and military to, to make it all work. Unfortunately, uh, it started to fall into place before the ships arrived, and it was a, a quite a successful um, deployment. So I recall at that time, I think Hawke was Prime Minister. That's correct, yeah. And 
he automatically committed um, Australian forces and we committed Navy. And I think a frigate was sent and we had Navy clearance divers sent and you were doing patrols up there trying to enforce the no-go zone. So it was suddenly a whole bunch of very new stuff in a new region that hadn't, with no disrespect to anyone, really been planned in advance, but it just shows the Navy and military system that the training's so good that we can adapt to that. Um, and, and you're posted there and you're, you're running that. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, the task group was three ships initially, uh, HMO Success with um, two FFGs. Commodore Don Chalmers at the time was the task group commander. But again, we hadn't operated in the Middle East for quite some time. And really, this was the first deployment, which has been ongoing ever since. Um, ships have been periodically deployed there. But all our training just fell into place. Um, yeah, my job was to set up a, a logistics support office and, and doing that in the port area was, was a challenge, having to build relations with the Amani Navy and the government and then put in place contracts to support the ship's fuel, water, etc., food. But again, all, all your training and experience, just it just it worked. And I think people should be aware that there was real threat to those naval ships, that there were these motor torpedo boats that had great agility and armament that could actually, if they got up close, you know, really cripple or, or damage one of our ships. So it, it wasn't as if we're just posting ships to the other side of the sea and they're tied up alongside. They're boarding people. There's real stuff happening and it's dangerous and challenging and full on. No, that, that's certainly true. Initially, um, the role was sanctions enforcement, stopping um, you know, merchant ships entering Iraq, searching them, removing any contraband. Uh, later on, once uh, approval was given to operate in the Gulf, the, the real threat then was mines, as well as um, the Iraqi Air Force. And again, at that time, we didn't know really what their capabilities were, whether they had chemical weapons or um, or other other weapons. But certainly the mines and the high-speed speedboats, which actually operate out of Iran as well as Iraq, uh, were real threats. And again, uh, there was lessons to be learnt on how to, to, uh, to manage and you know, counter those threats. David, I recall at this time that the Navy was doing its job, but things were a bit difficult until your Commodore actually was able to open some doors. That's right. Um, again, I, I'd, I'd have trouble making all the right connections ashore in Oman. But when we uh, made the connection between Commodore Don Chalmers and the Chief of Navy from Oman and realised that they'd both done the Royal College Defence Studies course in 1988, uh, and knew each other, the doors opened. Permission was given for us to set up an office in the uh, harbour and support came from uh, the Amani Navy, although they, politically they wanted to be low profile, which was interesting. But uh, but again, we were given access to anchorages down the coast, which uh, were most useful because uh, the ships didn't have to enter port so frequently. So the, the value of exchanges and doing courses overseas, uh, staff courses, is is really important. So, David, you're over in Oman, you're helping the fleet. How is interaction with the Air Force helping? As soon as the threat was known and there was concern about the risk to civil airlines, uh, civil airlines stopped flying through the Middle East. And so there was no way we could fly personnel or equipment in and out. Thus, it was important then for the Air Force to, to support Navy. And it did take them a little time to respond, initially thinking that when they had a full aircraft, they'd fly. But, uh, mm. but fortunately, when they realised that urgent defects were really urgent and uh, put ships at risk, um, they, they flew a weekly service for us. David, it's funny, I remember um, in the first Gulf War when hostilities were announced, even here in Sydney, how things changed, with sandbags going up at the front of Garden Island and personnel being instructed not to wear uniform to go to work. So it was a, a funny period, and I must say I'm so glad that things didn't go bad for us over there, that we, we were lucky, but again, I, I, I think you would have to agree, the more you train, the luckier you get with this job. No, that, that's right. Um, and again, because of that long period of peace uh, until the end of the Cold War, really the, the first Gulf War was our first operation, the UN-sanctioned operation, and that was closely followed by um, Rwanda, Somalia and uh, Cambodia, uh, some of them in, in parallel. So it was a busy time, but I guess that was a real wake-up call that security is important. And in current times, um, you know, we've moved, moved to even higher and tighter security uh, arrangements. But certainly um, the sandbagging of 
cuttable and, and buildings around Sydney uh, was a bit of an overkill at the time. David, can we move on to your next role when you joined the world of submarines? That was a really interesting five years of my career. Um, during that period, I, I did three different jobs in the submarine arm. The first one was in HMAS Platypus in Neutral Bay in Sydney, where I was sort of dual-hatted as the squadron and the base supply officer, and did that for a couple of years. That was just a, a, a traditional supply job. But then it changed uh, with the advent of Collins class coming into service and the move of submarine basing to Western Australia. Suddenly we had to think about how to move the squadron and encourage people to move. So that uh, was fairly successful with education programs and familiarisation flights, getting the submariners and their families to visit Western Australia and get a feel for what it was like. And then the squadron headquarters moved en masse. When, when we did that, uh, I became the squadron corporate manager, again, responsible for supply and logistics duties in the squadron, but, uh, but also manpower. In the submarine world, manpower has always been a challenge. Then finally, uh, again, the Submarine Training and System Centre, which is where the Collins training was conducted, had to transition from the contractor, Australian Submarine Corporation, to Navy. And again, there was no submarine qualified officer to take over that position, again, because of shortages. So I was asked to, to be the inaugural director of the Submarine Training and System Centre, which was a, a wonderful, challenging experience. It went on for um, yeah, just on two years. And it, that involved Collins training, Oberon training, uh, submarine escape training, and also tactical development. So it was, it was a really interesting period with a fairly diverse uh, workforce, civilians, uniforms, and academics. David, you have a variety of roles after that, including promotion to captain. But I wanted to jump to the fast tracking of the preparation for Canimbla for deployment. And of course, this is the name of your father's ship. And now you're preparing it for the second Iraq war. However, the deployment was a secret at the time. And can you tell us more about this challenge? Certainly. I, I, I was in the um, amphibious and afloat support group at that time, which was a newly established force element group responsible for 11 ships. And two of them were the LPAs, Canimbla and Menorah. And during that uh, 1991 to 1993, those ships deployed several times. But the, the second time uh, when conflict was expected, HMAS Canimbla had to be prepared over the Christmas period Again, it was a matter of doing it in a, a secure environment because the government hadn't announced the deployment. Again, uh, just December, January is a, a difficult time to get contractors working, but, but doing it in a secure envelope where um, the people who need to know, um, it's initially very small and then uh, obviously expands over time. But uh, getting people working on, on various projects to enhance the ships as well as contractors in that environment is particularly difficult. But it, it was achieved and, and really uh, as people understood what was required and most didn't ask questions, they just got on with it. And we, we managed to put in things like ballistic protection and an army surface-to-air missile was a, a, attached to the ship, uh, as well as chemical detectors and uh, communication systems. So it was a significant amount of enhancement required, but achieved in time and the, and the ship deployed as planned. David, can you walk us through the final years of your career you were a diplomat, for example, in East Timor. Can you tell us a bit of how that happened? Well, I'd had a, probably three years lead up to that in the uh, strategic studies world, working at the uh, Defence College in Canberra, the Centre for Defence and Strategic Studies, but also having done the Indian National Defence College course. So, so during those sort of periods, you, you, you broaden your horizons, you start to understand international relations and strategic issues uh, much more clearly. And, and for me, it was a logical progression to, to volunteer for a position in East Timor as the defence attaché. And, and I did that job in 2007, 2008. Again, uh, the downside of that, or the, the interesting part of it really was that in 2006, there'd been a lot of communal violence in East Timor. The army had melted down. Over half the army had petitioned the government. Uh, they weren't classified as deserters, but they, they left. And so there, there was, you know, really uh, serious security issues in Timor. And we had the UN mission there, plus the Australian and New Zealand International Stabilisation Force working there. So, so the job as the attaché, which is to represent the Australian Defence Force, covered a lot of things. We, we had a defence cooperation program. We had to work with the, the security operations there, as well as the normal diplomatic type uh, activities. So it was a very challenging and an interesting experience um, and very, very rewarding. 
And when do you actually retire from the Navy? Technically, I haven't retired. Uh, 2009, I left the permanent Navy and transferred to the reserves. Between 2009 and, and today, I've done several reserve jobs. Uh, probably the most interesting one was running the, the Navy museums and their, their heritage collection and a little short stint back at the Defence College in, in Canberra. So uh, technically, I haven't left yet. And David, today you're the president of the Naval Historical Society, which of course is the organisation that brought us together today. That's right. Uh, when, when I was doing that couple of years as the director of the Naval Heritage Collection, I had a fairly close liaison with um, the Naval Historical Society, headed up by uh, Paul Martin at the time. And, and so Paul invited me to, to join the committee, which uh, I felt, having been a member for a long time, I, it was convenient and easy to do, so I, I joined the committee. And then two years later, he asked me to uh, to run as president. Uh, so I've now been the president for, for two years. But shifting from you know, heritage items to actual history was a natural progression. There's a story behind every heritage item, and the Navy has some wonderful items in its uh, museums. But the History Society's charter is to um, promote an understanding of Australian naval history. Uh, and we do that in several different ways. Our membership uh, is in the order of 650. It's an all-voluntary organisation, a not-for-profit, and we, we support Navy as best as we can. I, I mentioned earlier history prizes, but, but we conduct tours of Garden Island, uh, which is very educational. Most people never get to see the inside the dockyard. We provide a research service. We um, have several questions weekly from members of the community about a whole range of subjects. We also provide a, a website, which is a huge resource. Uh, there's over 1,200 articles which have been published in the Society's magazine over the last 40 years, again, available to the public uh, through that. We see ourselves as a, a good resource for the community, and uh, our, our website, which is about to be uh, redeveloped or is being redeveloped, um, will be even better. And David, look, I could certainly testify to that. And I've been coming to the Historical Society since I was a young kid because my dad was one of the first archivists there. And he would take me with all his shipmates. And there was a lot of Shropshire guys there originally, and unfortunately, they've all passed on. But the wonderful stories that these veterans would tell, and you have now recorded, really make your library quite outstanding of original source material. And again, it's another one of these great unknown secrets. And with the advantages of technology, you're updating your website. I understand you're about to come up with your own podcasts. That's right. Um, the, the, the presentations which uh, have been delivered to members over the years uh, were often written up as, as formal papers. Uh, they were monographs and, and the Society still publishes those and they're, they're for sale on the website. But in this modern day and age, it, it's easy to record those presentations. And again, it's only in the last year or so that we've actually commenced recording them and, and publishing them as, as podcasts. Again, they're available on our website, uh, which um, is www.navyhistory.org.au. David, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you again today and sharing these wonderful Navy stories. I loved our time when we were on Spectacle Island together earlier last year and at the time I remember hearing about your very extended service and I think you are typical of what makes the Navy great that you can come in at the bottom work your way to the top have incredible experiences with massive diversification we're talking different countries different warships different jobs different political things you've done it all and it's wonderful now that you're keeping it alive with the history. Thank you so much for your service and thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story with us today. No, thanks, Angus. It's a pleasure. Be sure to check out the Naval Historical Society online. You can check us out online too. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Our Twitter is at LOTL Pod, and we're on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast. You can also email us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Contact us and let us know what you thought of the episode. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.